All right, I'm going to get things started because we have a, a pretty jam-packed presentation for you tonight. Um, so first, I want to introduce myself and welcome you to the Town of North Hempstead's Gardening with Native Plants workshop. Um, thanks again for joining us this evening. It's actually a quite a nice evening out, even though it's a bit windy. Uh, my name is Megan Festuca, and I'm an environmental specialist with the Town of North Hempstead. I work on sustainability projects, including the creation of native plant gardens in our parks. Um, and before we start, I just want to remind you that you've been muted. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can type them into the chat box at any time. And then we're going to pause um, about midway and then at the end to answer everyone's questions. Um, and also, we'll be recording the workshop and posting it to the town's sustainability page. So if you miss anything, um, you can watch it again or share it with anyone who might have missed it as well. So now I am pleased to introduce Rusty Schmidt, who is a landscape ecologist for the environmental consulting firm Nelson Pope and Voorhees. He works on a multitude of projects involving the creation of rain gardens and native plantings on Long Island, and he's very passionate about his work. He's been a great resource for me in my work for the town, as well as, as planting native plants in my own home landscape. So thank you so much for being here for us tonight, Rusty, and you can begin. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. I am Rusty Schmidt, I'm a landscape ecologist, which is just a made up term. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I went to school the first time for ecology, went to school for biology, chemistry, art, and then I went back to school for a master's in landscape architecture, but I was an ecologist first. I, I um, um, have done a lot of uh, kind of fun and amazing things as an ecologist before going back to school. So yes, I do landscape architecture. Yes, I do help homeowners and parks and um, and cities and villages. Uh, but what my all my work is sustainable and ecology background or ecology minded. So that's uh, kind of and so then that just makes an easy title. Um, and then the last thing is that I need to pass on is that I am from Minnesota. This is a Minnesota accent. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, and I have the long O, not the long A of, of, of folks in New York. So what I'm going to, I need to say one word now so that you can know what it is. And because uh, we'll say it a few times that uh, can confuse people. So as I have the long O, uh, not the long A, that yard area, that green space in front of your of of the house, you might call it a lawn, right? Uh, I'm gonna try to make I, I I tried my best Long Island accent there. I really I can't do it. It's it it just doesn't come into my head, and I have to really think about it. So I call it a lawn. So I have the long O. So lawn instead of lawn. Um, and so uh, that's the one word that most people get tripped up on. Most of the rest are okay, but that, that one uh, can get people. So um, uh, enough about this, let's get going. So um, what, uh, it's not going, there we go. So why natives? Um, so most people think we talk, we're gonna talk about native plants because of the birds and the bees and the butterflies and um, and absolutely that's very important and we'll get into that. But there's other reasons why we want to stick to native plants and one of which is that um, they were here first. And so what was interesting, this is a map of the Minneapolis St. Paul area. This is the seven county metro area. It's the same um, uh, square miles and square acreage as uh, Nassau and Suffolk County of Long Island, and it has the same number of people in it as Nassau and Suffolk County. However, um, uh, what happened was this developed a lot later in the, in the, in the uh, start of our nation, and so this really happened in the 1800s, not the 1700s or 1600s, and so what really happened is that we were able to actually identify what was here before Europeans. So pre-settlement, this was the native biome that was in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So uh, there's this area right here, which is the Mississippi River. This is the Minnesota River that flows into it. 
The dark green areas are the big woods, which were maple basswood forests, which um, Laura Ingalls in the, in the big woods would have had that same kind of forest. Um, the, the, dark, the browner areas or the oak openings, the tan areas are prairies. Oak openings are kind of a mix between prairie and oak savanna or have some oaks in them. And then, um, and then the dark brown is uh, wet meadows. Um, and there's a few other things there too, but you can see that it's pretty much, that's what was there. Um, just like here in Long Island, uh, the purple areas, that's all that's left. Um, everything else has been developed in some way or fashion. Um, and, and so we have had the same issues as what, what you have already seen here on Long Island. So here in Long Island, um, Plants on the North Shore, especially in along the, uh, um, um, the town of North Hempstead, all the way through the Port Washington, or yeah, Port Washington Peninsula, is that we were a, a coastal oak forest dominated by tulip trees, black and red oak, um, beech, black birch, and red maple, with an understory dominated by uh, dogwood. Um, and then occasionally we get sweet gum or pin oaks, um, and we would have um, you know a, a mix of of the the laurels or uh, hickories underneath all the uh, the bigger woods. And so that's really what the North Shore is like. Um, and we also had on this on the and this big area in the middle here in much of Nassau County, which was about 50 acres, by the way, or 50 square miles, sorry, 50 square miles, was the Hempstead Plains grassland, which uh, 50 square miles um, uh, was huge at the time. And there's only 13 acres left. It's called the Hempstead Plains. Um, it's where Charles Lindbergh took off from, uh, and it was protected mainly for that reason. Um, and so there's this little space left of, of the uh, Hempstead Plains, which is a prairie, a meadow, not much different than what's over my shoulder in my in my picture. It was the the meadow was was um, the dominant uh, uh, plant type or ecosystem on in much of Nassau County, um, and it's the furthest eastern prairie in the U.S. And yet there's very little of it left. Uh, and then as you keep going east, especially on the southish side, we have an oak brush plains before it turns into the Pine Barrens, which is most of the east and most of Suffolk County. Um, and you can see that the North Shore is kind of stayed consistent with tulip and oak, the coastal oak and things like that. But the south side has really was either um, plains, uh, Hempstead Plains, or oak uh, uh, brushland, or primarily um, uh, the pine barrens. What the issue is, is that this is all that's left on Long Island is the yellow areas. And you'll notice that they're all associated with uh, either large uh, parks like Homestead um, State Park um, or, hemp, um, uh, or others like that, or um, you will notice that there's a nice section of pine barrens that's been left alone. Uh, out on the east end. And that's really, that's all that's left of what was here originally. And if you look at Nassau County, it's almost all been uh, eliminated except for the Hempstead Plains and a couple big, large open spaces that are left. Uh, one of which is uh, uh, about 400 acres um, uh, over in the Manhasset area, uh, uh, Shelter Rock Road area. So the, the importance of having all those uh, plants that were here originally, that they're really used to our climate with our, our uh, colder winters, our hotter summers, drier summers, wet springs, wet falls. They're really used to exactly, and our sandy soils, they're really used to here on uh, Long Island. And they're used to and, and are well adapted to our climate and our, our weather patterns. The, so by changing that, we have really changed the plant species of most of our yards to be something that's not as 
natural or native here. And so then we have to do things like add water, add nutrients, add things that, um, that Mother Nature is not uh, that we don't have here on Long Island that Mother Nature, uh, these plants need that Mother Nature is not providing. And so the other piece to this is it's about roots. Um, our, our lawn grass has roots that are only a couple inches deep. Most of our native plants, especially our meadow plants, um, have roots that go multiple feet deep. Um, and so, and, and to kind of point that out, lawn grass is over here on the far left. And our plants like purple coneflower has roots that go down six feet deep. Um, big blue stem, our, one of our native uh, grasses on the, on the south shore, or little blue stem, which is native throughout almost all of Long Island, have roots that go six to eight feet. Um, and, and they're still not even some of the bigger ones. We have this plant called a uh, lead plant. It's almost a... Uh, uh, silvery leaf, purple flowered shrub. It's absolutely amazing uh, plant. It has roots that go 15 feet deep. And if you've ever been to the High Line uh, in New York City during June, you've seen this plant in bloom. It is uh, it's a one of the dominant plants that they put along their meadow. Uh, it's absolutely a stunning plant and brings in a ton of other things. Why this is important is that all of our plants whether they're our native plants or the potted plant that's in your window, um, your tomatoes out in the garden, every plant in the, or in the wild or in nature um, that sloughs off one third of their roots annually, stopping to grow one third of their roots and put down new roots looking for new nutrients and new water. And the old root decomposes and decays and leaves a hole in the soil. And by doing that, what happens is when water comes in that has uh, and comes over the top, it goes down those roots and it's kind of uh, those old root channels. So we call them root channels or macro pores, but they're kind of reverse straws. If you think about them, water comes and finds these holes and soaks deep into the soil column. And as it goes by, it's getting cleaned and cooled. So that's uh, uh, cooling down. Uh, with soil temperatures, but it's getting cleaned by the mycorrhizae, the bacteria, and the fungi that are naturally in our soils, breaking down those nutrients, breaking down chemicals, allowing the plants to take them up, or binding those chemicals to the soil matrix. And, and really, uh, uh, so that within two to three feet under that soil, that water is drinkably clean. And then you're aerating the soil and getting deep soil uh, complexes with deep soil horizons or topsoils that actually increase the biodiversity on the property as well or in your soils. So this was, um, this picture is uh, from about 2016 or so. I went to the uh, um, na National uh, Botanical Gardens in Washington DC with my daughter for spring break and this was one of their exhibits. Um, and so uh, the gal that's pictured here is probably about five foot four. So you can see that these roots are, oops, uh, these roots are uh, anywhere between eight to 15, 20 feet deep. And you can see that they are tied up, most of them. And this is little blue stem. This is big blue stem. Uh, this is switchgrass. These are plants that are found right here on Long Island on our shores. So I have a question for everyone to think about. What is uh, what do you think is the biggest crop in the U.S.? Okay, now you've thought about it. Uh, and there's more acreage of this crop than all the other crops combined. It is lawn grass. There's more lawn grass by acreage across the U.S. than there is uh, for all the other crops combined. Wheat, corn, soybeans. Uh, whatever, strawberries, blueberries, pecans, all of it combined does not equal lawn grass. Um, in fact, we are, um, uh, we have about, we've converted about 62,500 square miles, about 4 million acres to suburban lawn grass. And it's a crop. We water it, we fertilize it, we take care of it, we manage it. But what do we get out of it? We're not feeding ourselves with it. We're not feeding anything else with it other than uh, Canada geese. And so it is 
something that we need to think about. It's really about aesthetics and not about, um, or playing ball, absolutely, at a ball field or a picnic area, absolutely, it's useful for some spots, but not very many places. And we're still converting about 2 million acres um, every year, um, about the size of the Yellowstone National Park. Every year, we're still adding more lawn grass. And so today's suburbia um, supports very little biodiversity. Most of our yards have less than 5% um, native plants. It's usually a couple of trees in the yard and that's about it. So think about your own property for a second here in Nassau County and, and or it's more specifically in the town of North Hempstead. How big is your lot and how many native plants do you think you have there? And I bet it's a very small percentage. And and we're really, you know, the 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 new science articles that are coming out are suggesting that that uh, lack of biodiversity is actually even contributing to some of the things like pandemics that are going on. The other piece that lack of biodiversity is really happening is it's really having an impact on our birds and wildlife. And so our my challenge to you, our challenge as a as a humans is what could we do to our uh, to redesign suburbia? I am not saying we're going to wipe out our homes and uh, replace them with meadows and woodlands, but maybe what we can do is start getting functional uh, ecosystems in our own backyards by doing things like improving and increasing the amount of native plants that you have on your own property. So watch this for a second. This is um, uh, this is going to change before your eyes. Where do we have an opportunity to make some changes? It's all of those areas along the edge of, and I'm going to go back one and do it again. It's between the yards. It's um, uh, in front yards. It's along the edges. It's really having an opportunity to increase biodiversity on your property. And when you increase biodiversity, what you're going to bring in first is the insects. And I know some people are a little worried about that, but it's really important. And if you have a good diverse um, um, habitat in your yard, you're not only gonna bring in um, a bunch of caterpillars and uh, bumblebees, but you also will bring in some spiders and wasps that eat some of those other things. They're not gonna be stinging you. They're not trying to attack you. They have no interest in you whatsoever. They're more interested in the cicadas or the grasshoppers or things. We have predatory insects that go after the other ones. And so um, that it's, and insects are the most important biome on, on the planet. It is transferring the energy from our, our flowers and our grasses and our trees and bringing them energy into their bodies that feeds other critters. In fact, 96% um, of our terrestrial birds um, rear their, their young or feed their, their babies on insects. And if you don't have the insects, you don't get the birds. And uh, they, uh, so most birds bring in uh, again, 96% of our birds bring in a caterpillar every three minutes to their um, to their nest. So that's like 6,000 insects, caterpillars specifically, that they bring to their brood of birds. And most of our birds breed and raise two broods per year. That's really hard to say for some reason. <laughs> so they so they'll do one early in the spring and another one um, uh, early summer, and they'll raise two sets of, of young. And so then that's 12,000 insects that they need. So they need to have the insects. And our insects need the plants. In fact, 90% of all of our insects need to have a specific kind of plant to grow on at some part of their stage of their, of their uh, life. So the picture on the right is the uh, monarch caterpillar. And most people know that the monarch caterpillar needs milkweed. And so we need to have that milkweed to have the monarch caterpillars to have monarch butterflies. If you don't have the milkweed, you're not gonna get 
to uh, raise caterpillars to turn into uh, butterflies. The one on the left, um, that is a black swallowtail. It is uh, our biggest uh, and, and most beautiful uh, butterfly, I think, um, in my opinion, on Long Island. And that black swallowtail needs to have our, um, if you have parsley in your garden, it might go after that, but it goes after the native parsleys like golden alexanders and, um, and our native celeries and, uh, and, and things in, our, in, our, in the wild. And that's what they grow. And if they, and then the next thing about these caterpillars is they don't really want to become food for birds. So they either they're in, uh, they either make themselves poisonous, like the monarch caterpillar, they drink the sap of the monarch of the milkweed, and which is a, a poison. They make themselves poisonous. They turn bright orange and tell all of the world that please don't eat me, or they hide. So the bottom left is a liatris cat, uh, moth that is hiding on a liatris flower, and they actually takes little bits of the flower and puts on its back to hide. The upper right one is uh, a arborvitae um, uh, caterpillar, and uh, it looks the bottom is the caterpillar, the top is the leaves, and it hangs out on the arborvitaes and eat arborvitaes. And look at that, it looks just like it. And the middle and the bottom right, it's my favorite one, is the laurel caterpillar. It's on a laurel leaf. And if you look really hard, the caterpillar's back stripe is not lined up with the vein of the, of the leaf. It's a little bit taller. So it hides right in the middle of that leaf. And so every time we plant a plant that's not native, that's alien, meaning a plant from another area, we are reducing the local insect population because we do not have plants that are raising the insects that we want to grow. And um, Cornell University has been uh, showing that our bird population has dropped by 35% in the last um, uh, number of years, uh, 20 to 50 years, mainly because of habitat. And that is mainly due to uh, insects not being available for our, our, our critters to eat. And so, um, so think about this for a second. When you bring in a plant that's uh, uh, oriental, uh, Japanese, um, you know, a Japanese variety or a Euro English, European variety um, and or Asian variety, a plant that you bring into the US it doesn't mean it's a bad plant. It just isn't as good. It, it might be beautiful. It might do a lot of nice things for the look of your yard. Um, and even still might even have some pollen or nectar that the bees will like, but there is no insect here that grows on it that is going to enjoy uh, that plant. And it really becomes a barren plant uh, for raising our insects. Um, so, and eventually, uh, the bad insects do come, so everyone's kind of heard of the lanternfly coming to um, uh, Long Island and, and uh, New Jersey. And what do you think they eat? They eat um, uh, the tree of heaven, which is an oriental uh, 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 Asian tree. So we have a tree from Asia, and now the bug has come, and that bug is uh, becoming very, very problematic across uh, the area, a new invasive species, and the reason why it's um, adapted well here is that we already brought the plants here. So not all native plants are equal. Some are more robust with growing a lot more insects than others, and our trees for the most part do better job than our grasses and flowers. Um, however, uh, some of our trees, and especially the ones on the North Shore, because I told you right at the beginning, uh, tulip and oak trees are a dominant plant along the North Shore. Oak trees is the most dominant plant across Long Island, and oaks just happen to be have the highest production of caterpillars. Um, oak, uh, the oak trees bring in 534 different kinds of caterpillars. Uh, black cherries 
also very high, and they are a very uh, common plant in amongst the oaks. Uh, willows and birches, you work your way down. There are a couple shrubs in there, blueberries, um, one of our most dominant plants in the, in the understory, uh, brings in tons of, of, uh, of bugs as well. Um, maples and all the way down to hawthorns. So that's kind of our trees. Some of our perennials, um, some, the, the biggest one is goldenrod. Uh, our solidagos, 115 different kinds of caterpillars utilize the solidago or the or the goldenrod uh, plant. Um, and most of the plants around this list are native. There's one because this list came from a um, uh, south, more southern area. The morning glory on that list is not native, but everything else is. And so you can kind of see that they all have uh, a part to play. If you would like to get a better understanding of of how this all works. Uh, a great reference book and a good read is Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy on the left. He's now produced two more books that are also very good, but the first one, really start with the first one, Bring Nature Home. It really kind of gets you an understanding of all of what I'm saying in a lot better detail and a lot more science behind it than here's the feel good story. I don't have the time to get into the details. Um, but, and then if you really want to understand what plants to plant for certain pollinators. Uh, Heather Holmes um, has a, a series of books. The first one here is Plant uh, Pollinators of Beta Plants. And you can actually look up a bug and then see what host plants it is, or look up a plant and see what come, is attracted to that plant. So there's a couple different ways of looking at it. So we talked about host plants, and so I'm going to pick out a few that I, I like to bring to people's attention. The Luna moth um, comes out in the, you know, at night. It's a stunning, stunning moth. If you've ever seen one in, in real life and or if you've ever got to uh, grow one, it's uh, one of the most spectacular um, moths, in my opinion, um, that you can find. The Luna moth needs a uh, walnut family of plants, uh, hickories and sumacs. Um, the Painted Lady, the most common butterfly on Long Island, needs yarrows and pearl everlastings. The Buckeye Moth, my it's my favorite uh, moth, or sorry, Buckeye Butterfly, my favorite butterfly because of its uh, amazing color. I, I think this is the most stunning one in my opinion. Um, needs uh, the plantains and toad flax and other uh, uh, false loosestrife, um, all native Cool plants. It might be one of the more ugly caterpillars, but one of the coolest uh, butterflies. Hackberry uh, butterfly needs hackberry trees. And the um, uh, azure butterflies, the summer and spring azure butterflies, these are the little blue ones, the end of your pinky size, uh, bright blue on the inside when they open up their wings. Um, uh, really use New Jersey tea um, and uh, one of my favorite shrubs that are underutilized um, that uh, should be used in many yards. And of course, you don't when you bring in a do a pollinator garden, you don't just get the pollinators, you also get uh, of, of butterflies and uh, you really get the bees. Um, bees are really important to our biomes. Um, if you want fruit and veg, you need to have the uh, bees pollinating and, uh, and, and getting uh, the, the plants to produce. And so bees are a high importance um, in, in all of our, of all the insects. This is the one that we try to protect the best. Um, and so the more diverse your, your planting, the more bees that you have. So that picture on the upper left, I walked in there and took pictures of all the different kinds of bees that were on the flowers um, that you can see. And we have sneezeweed in the bottom left. Um, we have a milkweed in the middle, which is uh, swamp milkweed. We have Joe pie weed on the upper right, and we have great blue lobelia in the bottom right. Many of our bees, and I'll talk about them briefly, many of our bees. Uh, live in the ground. Um, they're ground cavity bees. Um, they're not going to sting you. They're not going to hurt you. 
most of our, all of our bumblebees and many of our other bees um, uh, go into the ground to, uh, to nest. They're not really in a hive. They're in each hole has uh, just a few uh, eggs in each one. The holes um, are a little bigger than ant holes, uh, so that and they push out a little more soil. So that's how you can tell it's a bee uh, and not ants. Um, and uh, they really bring they what they do is they go grab a, a bunch of pollen, bring up uh, create it into a ball, bring it into the hole, make a pollen ball, uh, drop an egg on it, and then do it again over and over again. And so that's how they uh, grow and and raise their young. There's a few bees like carpenter bees, um, uh, mason bees that live in uh, cavities. Um, uh, I prefer having dead wood on the, having a little bit of uh, decaying wood on the property for all my bees instead of these bee boxes that are on the upper left. Uh, bee boxes are okay. Um, however, it's a lot more, you can't just put it up and walk away. You're gonna need to clean them out um, there has been colony collapse disease that has been hitting our honeybees that have started to hit some of our native bees in these, uh, in these boxes. So be careful. They're not all made the same. Make sure you understand what's uh, right about them and not right about them. Um, and then the last thing is most of our bees that are cavity nesters are actually hibernating at, in our stems of our plants. Um, so these are the small bees, the little sweat bees, nomad bees, um, um, and some, and some uh, those are ones I catch on my, my tongue at the moment, but there's a, there's, uh, a good 60, 70 species of these small bees that nest inside of stems. Um, and so when you cut back your garden, whether it's native or not native, uh, when you cut back your garden in the fall, you've actually eliminated all that habitat and probably killed a whole bunch of bees in, the in return. They've already probably nested in the stems. So um, one of the things that I would like you to consider, if you don't learn anything else from today, is if you just won't cut back your gardens until spring after it's consistently 50 degrees and those bees have emerged. So usually mid-April to uh, mid-May, somewhere in there, um, is uh, the timing. Here on Long Island, it tends to be end of a um, middle of April to early May, and uh, then cut back as you need. If you do feel the need to cut back your gardens in the, in the fall, please cut them back to 10, 12 inch, inches off the ground so that you have some habitat for those bees that have nested. Okay, so that's a little bit of why. I wanna explain what we have for options for you. Uh, the town of North Hempstead uh, provides a native plant re um, rebate pilot program um, for uh, residents of, within the town of North Hempstead. Um, you can go to the website on the bottom, sustain at North Hempstead, oh, sorry, that's a email address, sustain at NorthHempsteadNY.gov um, and you can sign up for a $350 per household um, uh, grant uh, re, uh, uh, rebate. So you show pictures of the lawn, uh, get approved ahead of time, show pictures of the lawn, replace your lawn for um, uh, a native garden or a rain garden, uh, and then uh, prove that that's been done and ask for uh, your rebate of $350. So that is, uh, it's the old, by the way, it's the only community on Long Island that's doing this. So it is a great program. Um, there's other communities that are starting to think about doing it similarly, but you guys are the first. So it's, uh, please consider it and uh, reach out to sustain at northhempstead.gov. Just let me uh, cut in for one second. Um, so we are applying for funding for this year. We've had this program for the past two years. We are hopeful that we will get it again, um, but we don't have it yet. So it's not, oh, you know, it's sorry. not a done deal, unfortunately, <laughs> just because we we're in the process of applying and hopefully we'll find out in April. So if you are interested, some of you may have already emailed me, but emailed this um sustain at NorthHempsteadNY.gov that will go to me and then I will put you on the list so that to, I can contact you once we find out if we get the funding or not. 
Okay, sorry about that. I thought you That's already okay. got it. No. Okay. I'm always jumping the gun. <laughs> and then uh, the next thing is um, most people have a hard time finding plants. Uh, native plants are not easy to find um, in our local community gardens, uh, or not um, our local uh, community uh, nurseries, um, and so um, or garden centers. So here are a bunch that you can uh, look into. Um, uh, long and these are our folks that sell uh, retail, so um, not wholesale. Um, so Long Island Natives in Eastport. Um, and there's a website there. Um, uh, take a picture of this from with your phone if you're if I'm going to move too fast. Uh, uh, Warner Nursery. It's unfortunately it's out in Southampton, but it's a, a great nursery. Uh, Vicky Bustamante is uh, who runs this portion of, of Warren's Nursery. Decker's Nursery is a um, a local nursery that's in East Northport that carries uh, uh, a lot of these plants that are that you can find at Warner's um, or Long Island Natives or Glover Perennials. And then uh, the Limpy Plant Sale has, uh, will have a sale coming up in, uh, in spring and then they sell throughout the summer, but they have two big plant sales, one in spring and one in fall. And so um, what I would recommend is that none of them are very close to you. Um, and some of your big ones like Hicks Nursery does not carry uh, very many native plants. And when they do, they're usually cultivars, not real natives. And I won't go there yet, um, but that's, uh, that's so th they're not always the best is what I'm saying. Um, so um, nothing against Hicks. They're good people. They have good plants. They just don't always carry what we're looking for. And when they, and so what I would like you to do is go to those nurseries and ask for specific native plants and get them to start carrying them. That's the only way we're gonna change the industry is that by asking for them and then buying them. You can't ask for them and then they carry them and then you don't buy them. That's, that doesn't do us any good either. So you have to actually or, uh, uh, order and purchase and by having that purchase, they have to make money. If they don't make money on these plants, they're not going to carry the plants. So please uh, do that. But these uh, four places will have the plants that you're looking for. My recommendations: go to their website, um, get their what's available, order the plants ahead of time. They'll pull the plants, set them aside, so that when you're going all the way out there, you can go and pick them up. They're ready for you. All you have to do is pay for them. Um, and then you can shop a little bit after that, but they, that's, that's my recommendation. There's two organizations in, on Port Washington Peninsula that I want you to know about. Rewild, um, yeah, they um, are a great nonprofit organization that are promoting and helping folks expand um, and uh, convert lawns to uh, native gardens. And they have a plant sale every spring and every fall. So on their website, uh, rewildlongisland.org backslash plant sale, you can see what they will have this coming spring. Garvey's uh, Point Museum also has a native plant sale. Now there is a couple other folks that do sell native plants very well. Um, the one that I don't have on this list, I'm really sorry to say, is um, Drop Seed Natives. They're in Hempstead on the South Shore, um, but Drop Seed Natives, uh, you can find them online and it's Drop Seed, one word, Native uh, Nursery. And they, uh, uh, his name is Anthony Marinello. He has a lot of very cool plants and his, his list is changing all of the time. He's right now taking orders for April and he has uh, uh, a good list of plants that they'll have ready for mid-April. Um, and then look at, there's a whole bunch of garden groups out there, organizations. In Northport, there's the Northport Native Garden Initiative. Doesn't mean you have to be in Northport. You can definitely, they, they're on Facebook and the Long Island Native Garden Group. Both groups are on Facebook. It's a great way to learn a whole, you can ask questions. You can uh, look what other people's questions are. You can look at past posts. They have a whole bunch of great information about natives and how they work. Um, and 
uh, they promote uh, sales and native sales and things like that as well. Audubon, one more. Audubon um, tends to have an Audubon sale every every spring as well, um, but I'm not sure where they locate that if it's in Oyster Bay or one of the other areas. So uh, Audubon birds, they tend to have a, a, a pretty nice spring sale as well. Okay. Uh, I can't think of any others off the top of my head. Um, this is maybe a good spot to take uh, questions. And then because the rest of the way is pretty pictures and how to's. Okay, great. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, has the amount of lawns and native plants changed in the last 35 years on Long Island? Um, yes, and probably to the negative. Even though since in the last 10 years, since I've been on Long Island, um, I think there's a tenfold increase in people knowing what native gardens are and using native plants, and it's exponentially going up. However, there is more than that of new development going on Long Island all the time, and almost all new development is for uh, either pavement or lawns around uh, uh, gardens or lawns around new new development. And so I have not seen um, I've seen more uh, development doing negative impacts than I've seen with a whole bunch of good people doing the right thing, trying to increase native plants. So it native plants have improved, but it's not as fast as development is taken away. Great, thanks. Well, not great, but thank you for the answer. <laughs> That's not um, the answer I another... want to give, by the way. That's, <laughs> yeah. I hope I hope within the next ten years that completely reverses. But uh, you know, I don't I don't want to hold my breath. I, I hope so too. Um, um, another question is, are there any fruit and vegetable plants that are native and edible? Oh, tons, 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 tons. So uh, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, raspberries um, are the easy ones that most people know about. But there are also uh, hickory uh, and um, hazelnut are, are a couple of the nuts. Um, uh, some of the other berries that I love, um, Aronia melanocarpa, um, black chokeberry is one of my favorite fruits for uh, jams and jellies. Um, uh, it's a native, beautiful shrub, and I will show it later, um, but it's a beautiful native shrub that has these black berries that are not only edible, but makes a great jam and jelly. My Mom called them June berries. Here on Long Island, we call them service berries. Um, Amelinkers, uh, which is a short tree, has these beautiful red berries in June, hence why my dad, my mom called them June berries. They are the sweetest fruit you will ever eat in your life, so long as you can beat the birds. Um, the birds are gonna try to get to them first. Um, and, uh, and then there's some big things like pawpaw uh, or, um, which is um, a beautiful, big, juicy fruit, or persimmons that, uh, that most people don't realize are native to Long Island. And persimmons is, is another big fruit from the tree where papa is a, a tall shrub. Um, and then, uh, then there's things like elderberry that, uh, that makes great uh, wine, fruit, uh, fruits, liqueurs, uh, elderberry is used in a, a whole variety of ways. There's elderberry flower liqueurs, there's elderberry wines or liqueurs, there's elderberry jams and jellies and, and things like that. So elderberry is another one that has a lot of uh, great potential. Um, so that's a, a smattering of, of good tasty ones. Um, and I didn't even go down the route of a bunch of the tubers and things. Oh, one, of my, uh, one more, gotta say it. Sassafras um, is one of our most common uh, shrubs, short, sh tall shrubs, short trees in our understory of our woods. And sassafras was uh, what makes root beer, or sassafras. So, you know, it's a variety of different things for different reasons. Great, thank you. Um, 
Another one last question, and then we'll get back to the presentation. Um, someone wants to know more question for me if I'm working with any towns to extend native gardening initiatives. Um, I have talked to people at town of Hempstead who are interested in doing a program like this, so I'm hoping that they will, will get get that going soon. Um, I don't know if they're definitely doing it or not. I actually live in town of Hempstead, so I always want, you know, my town to be doing things like this too, so I'm hopeful that they will. So if anybody out there is from town of Hempstead, keep a lookout. I know they're working on a mailer about native plants too, so that's great that they're trying to get, you know, more outreach out there. And, um, and, Suff and Suffolk County is looking at it at a countywide as well. And um, and uh, the Peconic Estuary Program out in the um, far east end in the in the mouth of the crocodile, um, they have that's the Peconic Estuary. All the watershed that goes there, they have a program uh, that's um, mainly about stormwater, but they're adding native gardens to it in the in the next year. I also have heard that the Long Island Regional Planning Council is looking yep. to do you know, expand that Baconic Estuary program to all of Long Island. So if you're not in town of North Hempstead and you're looking to create these gardens, um, keep a lookout for them and check and see, I don't know if they're, when they're releasing this program, but I have heard that it's moving forward, so. Yep. Um, one more quick question. Um, any native plants that are a particular problem for dogs? Um. Okay, so if you look at every single plant and look very particularly about dogs, there's a few that, not very many, but there's a few that can be problematic to dogs, but I have a whole pack of dogs and my whole yard's full of native plants, and um, I never really worry about it. Um, um, the dogs don't tend to eat um, my plants, um, and I have foster dogs, I have strange dogs come to my yard, and I've never really had a, had an issue in my entire lifetime. Um, and I've never, and I'm in the dog world community with uh, fostering, and again, I've not really have heard any horror stories of, of a pet problem. Um, what usually happens is if it is something that's that they shouldn't be eating and they take a nibble of it, they usually uh, uh, sick it up immediately and then that's it. They don't ever come back to that plant um, if you have that curious dog. But again, very seldom, I, I, I've never heard of it uh, and, I've, and I don't worry about it in all of my designs. Um, right. Now, with that said, if you're really concerned and you have that dog that just eats anything, look up each plant. Um, there is information on, on, on each plant for uh, uh, humans and, and uh, people and dogs. Okay, now let's get back to the presentation. I think that was all the questions for now, but if you have any more, please keep typing them in and then at the end, we'll get to all the other ones. Okay. So um, the rest of the way, I'm going to try to show a bunch of pictures and and of uh, native gardens. Um, this is a wild and woolly one. Um, it's also a rain garden, which is in the talk next week. Um, but uh, these, this is a, uh, a more of a meadow look. Um, and uh, what's kind of interesting about this meadow look is that um, you might have a whole bunch of weeds in there, and nobody would ever know because um, uh, well, one, some people think this all looks like weeds, and I'm sorry to say that that's their opinion, but I'm going to tell you, uh, the weed, these are all native plants, and because it has that wild look or random look, you would never really notice any of the problem plants. Um, so here's a, here's, we're going to do a, a, a garden here that is done by kids, uh, that are in the third to uh, fifth grade. And so what we're going to do is we have this area that we're going to plant. We didn't even kill the grass. We just mulched over the top. Uh, by putting the mulch down, we killed the grass in place. Um, we just made it a, a nice thicker mulch. Um, for you at home, what I would recommend is putting down cardboard and then mulch. Uh, it will do a better job than what we did here, but we, I, 
I had enough trouble with the kids as it was. So, and of course, every time I work with kids, it rains. Uh, so we uh, then once we got the mulch in place, um, we gave each child a six pack of plants, a trowel, and um, and they brought out their school ruler and they stabbed the ground, uh, made the hole, planted these plugs um, of native plant. So each plug is a is a plant. It's in a six pack, kind of like you get your pansies or petunias. They bro broke up the bottom, stuffed them in the hole. Uh, you know, I taught them how to do it green side up <laughs> and then um, push the soil back, put the mulch down, put the ruler, went a foot away, did it again. Um, it's all, they were never going to follow a design anyway, so I didn't care. And so it's randomly placed. Um, this is what it looked like one year later. And so I, I could hear the oohs and ahs from here. It was great. Uh, so, so uh, the all these plants, except for one, you can find right here in Long Island. The the ones here in the in the up or lower right corner are uh, wild bergamot or bee balm. Um, the yellow plants back here are are black eyed susans. The purple flowers that the the flowers are hanging down. This is pale purple cone flower. It's the native cone flower. The purple flowers that are standing up in this uh, middle ground here is uh, Agastache, which is hyssops, um, and they are, uh, th this is the native anise hyssop. The, it, behind that is the pale purple ones on the bottom are marsh milkweed. The darker purple ones to the left, it's just a couple uh, flowers, are um, uh, joe pieweed. The dark purple ones in the far back right corner our ironweed. And the only thing that's not native in this group is these tall yellow flowers. Uh, this is a yellow cone flower. That's the only one that's not found here on Long Island. You don't have to go with only uh, flowers and, and grasses. Um, you can do only shrubs. So this is, um, uh, this is a garden where we only planted two kinds of shrubs. Uh, the middle is red twig dogwood and the outside is fragrant low grow sumac. This is what it looked like five years or four years later. Nice and full, filled out the space. In the winter, the red twigs uh, show up in the winter. Uh, the, uh, they have bright white flowers in the spring. If I were able to do this all over again, which by the way, I'm getting to do one exactly like this at a, at a uh, place in Brookhaven, um, I have changed it from two shrubs to four shrubs. Um, two of the uh, one of the shrubs blooms in the middle of summer. Um, uh, the others bloom in the spring. We have great fall color. We have red twigs. We have red berries. We have a whole bunch of different things going on. So it really has a little more interest throughout the year. This is a great yard that's been done in the front yard. Uh, uh, it's in Nassau County. They completely removed all of the uh, lawn grass in their front yard and uh, replaced it with all natives. Uh, you have um, some Coreopsis, which is uh, tick seed, is that light yellow one right in our foreground. The tall spiky purple ones are a liatris. The orange flowers are um, uh, Asclepius tuberosa, um, um, butterfly milkweed. Uh, we have uh, some purple flowers in the back, which are purple cone flowers. The, uh, and uh, the, these yellow bean pods in the back left, um, are, those were blue flowers, now are yellowish bean pods that turn black. Um, and that was um, blue uh, false indigo. Uh, and so uh, there's some grasses here. There's a whole bunch of plants that will bloom in the, in the fall. And so this garden blooms all the way through the season at different times, at different ways. Um, this is at the Clark Botanical Gardens. Um, it's also an, a rain garden and, uh, it's, and it's used only native plants. It's on the back side of the white building. This is the same garden from the other side. There's a walking path through it. Uh, the water off the roof of the house and off the path goes and fills these rain gardens. That's why they're a rain garden, but the plants themselves, they bloom all the way through the season. 
you can have them a little more organized. You do not need to go wild and woolly and in big, you know, you can plant plants in patches. So the garden in the, on the left by the curb is all native plants. We've got purple coneflowers, little blue stem, black-eyed Susans, uh, that, um, that wild bergamot or uh, bee balm. This is an all shade garden. Everyone thinks that we only do sunny gardens. We do a lot of shade gardens. And unfortunately, I just got there and took this picture at the time that it's mostly green with only one white flower. Uh, uh, throughout, uh, there's gonna be a whole bunch of purple flowers here. There's gonna be a bunch of pink flowers back here. These purple flowers just finished blooming. Uh, and there's a bunch of yellow ones that are coming up in the middle. There's a big spike in the back that's going to be full of yellow. And so there's uh, flowers that bloom all the way through the season. But uh, there's, it's, uh, it's a mix of uh, textures with those ferns, grasses, thin, big broadleaf, thin, thin leaf, ground covers, tall, short, um, you know, color from a variety of seasons. Um, I think most people would say this is an absolutely stunning garden. Um, this is uh, some grasses in amongst uh, asters and tick seeds. So purple, uh, purple aster here and tick seeds. Uh, uh, the liatris, the purple uh, spikes were done blooming. But I want you to look at how it looks even late in the season when things are starting to die back. You're starting to get uh, different types of leaves, spiky balls. Uh, big leaf, little leaf, uh, little flowers, big flowers. It's a mix of things, and that's what draws your eye to this project. It's not having one type of garden. It's adding texture as well as size and color. Uh, and fall. This is all shrubs in a fall in a garden that's in the fall. This one's in Kansas City, um, but all these plants you can use right here in Long Island. And look at all that fall color. It looks great in the fall as well, right before the snow flies. This garden uh, mixes in a variety of different uh, techniques, and it's in front of this famous store that you all read the sign of right away because one of the techniques is the plants point at the sign. So having these plants angled that, uh, uh, like at a, like within a cemetery, that they're always pointing at that sign. And, uh, and, a variety, and so the plants are in order, in a structure, and uh, right after planting, unfortunately. So now if you go there, you can't see the mulch. It's all one big garden bed. And there's things like roses in here and tall, um, uh, uh, tall Carl Forster's grass. But then there's also a bunch of uh, uh, these shrubs that have the purple leaf or these trees or uh, things that just kind of line it all up. Would you like to stand outside the car wash of this garden uh, while you're waiting for your car? With all these uh, pollinator plants, you'd be just mesmerized or with the bees going from flower to flower, as well as uh, you know, seeing you know, all that activity. It's a lot more interesting than waiting for your car to come out and just watching the guys wash your car and, and dry it. So it's it's kind of a, it's, it's you know, and the cool thing about this one is all the excess water from the car wash goes into it. So it's being watered as well every time they run the car wash. This gentleman um, asked for this little garden in front um, and we did this garden full. Um, it turned out he loved it so much that he did the rest of his yard the next year. And so that garden in the foreground uh, with the bridge, but everything on beyond it. And so the only bit of lawn grass he has is in the is in the center. It takes him 10 minutes to, to mow it with a real mower. Um, and he puts his lawn chair there. He's got the bird bath there and the bird feeders. And he sits out there and reads his book and drinks his cup of coffee every day. What I've noticed is when uh, when when uh, people put in their native gardens, one, they tend to spend a little more time in there um, hanging out. But the other thing is when they go to weed, they go out, they, they, they say, oh, I'm gonna go out to weed and they pull their one weed because that's usually all there is. 
and they end up drinking a uh, diet soda <laughs> or adult beverage with a big smile on their face because they've added no water, they've added no fertilizer, and they've never had to deal with pesticides. They let it be. And we have started converting larger spaces as well. So this is a big lawn space between, I'm standing beside a, um, a, 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 a assisted living facility, that building in the, in the background by the weeping willow tree is a adult daycare. The uh, apartment buildings on the upper left is another uh, uh, assisted living facility. And all that area in between was mowed all the time. And so what we did is we converted it into a series of not only uh, rain gardens to stop water, but all native plants. Um, this is picture is taken in November, so all the plants are dying back for the season, uh, but it still is looking interesting even in November. And I'm going to tell you what's really cool about it is the homeowners at both the facilities love sitting out on their decks. They go wandering through. They love seeing the bees and the birds and the butterflies, and they spend more time uh, outside than they do inside now um, watching the activity that is outside. Um, the other, um, and then uh, this is a native garden that is in uh, um, Riverhead. And this one's at Mutton Town, just uh, not far from, uh, uh, it's in Nassau, it's the Nassau Hall at Nassau Swan Water Conservation District at Mutton Town. We built this in 2015. This is what it looks like in the fall. So I'm gonna go back. This is middle of summer. This is the fall. They look different every season. This is mostly native plants. Um, there's a few non-natives like the hostas in the foreground or uh, that peony, but most of the plants are native. And, uh, and what's really kind of cool is that don't you want to go down that path? Lawn grass is not the bane of all things. I just think that they need a place. And so in this case, it's the path. And you just want to walk down that path and go around the corner and see what's around the corner. It, 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 it draws you in. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite designs that we've done. A uh, very high-end home. Uh, and their entire front yard was converted into... Uh, native plantings. Between uh, this native planting that you see and their front door is their driveway, and you can't even see the driveway. And they have things like blazing stars, uh, purple cone flowers, yellow cone flowers, wild bergamot, prairie sage, black eyed Susans. These are all plants that we can get right here. Or it doesn't have to be huge, it can be just the little garden up by the mailbox. Uh, what a huge difference this brings in a ton of plants, um, or a ton of bees and insects with these native plants. We have, um, we got uh, uh, asters and coneflowers, cardinal flower in the background. So all three of those we can get here on Long Island. And instead of putting the prairie or meadow out in the back 40, put it up close to the house, still have that opportunity. And, and so instead of putting it all the way in the back of this property, they brought it up closer because that's where you're going to spend most of the time seeing and looking. And uh, I forgot I had this one. So that was that same uh, house that was planted in 2019 that we showed in Nassau County. Um, it's the, it, the uh, spring planting and then fall planting or fall of that same year. So you can see that you planted small, but look how full it was within one season. Okay, and, for, and that's rain gardens at Park Botanical Gardens. I didn't realize I had them there. So sorry, you got duplication, but this was uh, early planting as well. So the, the ones that you saw were from recent where these are original. Um, you can go with a riot of color. textures, 
ground covers, tall, short, organized or not organized. Uh, you can start creating filtered views, uh, creating privacy between one home and the next. So this is a series of townhomes and we planted a native garden in between with tall plants to block the windows from one bathroom to the other, but then also provide uh, plantings. And again, this was just after planting. And so there's a whole bunch of little plants that are just gonna take off. Or those areas that are hard to mow. One of my questions that I ask clients is, in your yard, what area do is uh, that you have in lawn grass, the only time you ever walk on it is when you mow the grass. If that's really the only time it's ever used, should it be in lawn grass? Sometimes that answer, I, I get, no, it has to be in lawn grass. Okay, I can't change that. But really, maybe it's an idea that you could put it into something else, into some kind of a habitat or area that does not need, need to be mowed. And I'm starting to convince industries or, or uh, businesses that instead of that little narrow uh, island for your cars to be parked under that has uh, you know, either concrete or lawn and a few trees, start looking at it more holistically. And I'm gonna tell you, where does everyone park? Under the shade of the trees. You can have plants in groupings. In fact, I really encourage you to plant your plants in groupings or clusters so that you get an organized look versus a more unorganized wild look. I personally like this, but not everyone does. And sometimes you really need to go tall because uh, you are trying to block or screen views. That's good too sometimes. In this case, this is a road that gets a little busy. Uh, they put up these tall purple cone flowers so that when they sit on the porch, they don't get uh, the traffic going past. So I want you to think about design for a little bit. Um, so a mix of grasses and forbs and shrubs, uh, natives and things plant in masses and drifts. So I want you to think about how to uh, lay out your gardens. So plants are the key component of a sustainable garden. Um, vegetation is suited to the conditions on your property. We're gonna conserve water. We're gonna increase energy efficiency to your homes. We're gonna actually even help with co uh, combat climate change in a, in a small way um, and enrich our lives with beauty and, and uh, flora and fauna. Uh, and then plants play an integral role in the Earth's uh, uh, major biogeochemical cycles, including hydrological, but more importantly, nitrogen and our carbon cycles. Um, by slowing down that water, keeping the nitrogen in the ground, not sending it to the bay where it turns into algal blooms and creates uh, epoxy zones and kills fish, um, and carbon, holding that carbon, keeping it into the soil, not releasing it into the atmosphere, uh, helping with uh, benefiting uh, climate change. So sustainable considerations, how do you assess your yard? So the first thing that I want you to think about in your yard and doing a Google Earth map uh, photograph will give you a good start. Where is the sun in the shade? Where is it full sun, meaning it's uh, getting most of the day sun um, or part sun where you're getting six to eight hours of sun? So and and or part shade is uh, I'm going to tell you uh, that if the sun is landing on it from noon to the end of the day, that is considered full sun because that heat and that hot and that direct sun is more intense than the east side uh, where it's only getting morning sun. Uh, where it's only getting morning sun, you might get closer to part sun to part shade. Uh, and then full shade is exactly what it means the north side of the house or the deep shade of, of a woodland. Part sun or part shade, you only need two to four hours of sun hitting that ground and I can get you a whole bunch of beautiful blooming plants to choose from. So understanding what is going on. If you're not sure, um, go out there and look. 
at different times of the day is the sun hitting the ground at uh, at uh, six in the morning, ten in the morning, noon, uh, two o'clock, five o'clock, eight o'clock, and that will help you understand what's going on. Soil types. Um, I can get into a long-winded discussion on how to determine what your soil conditions are, but here's the easy trick. Take, uh, you need about um, uh, a, a baggie full of soil, so about two cups of soil from scattered at different parts of where you want to plant your garden. Put it into a plastic uh, Ziploc bag and, and mail it with um, a form that you can get off the internet for Cornell Cooperative Extension, CCE. And if you use CCE soil test, Google search it, you'll find uh, the form and the small fee. You can turn it in and you get a report within um, uh, two weeks of exactly what your soil conditions are and what you can grow and what you might want to do to your soil to make it more appropriate for if you're doing a vegetable garden, for instance. Moisture levels, um, understand is it a soggy spot? Um, is that a spot that after it rains, it stays wet for um, a day or so? Does it stay wet for a week? Does it dry out and is rock hard within hours? Get an understanding of what's going on with your soil. And again, you could just go out after rain or during a hot day and, and feel around and test the soil and feel it. Is it damp or not? Um, slope. If your slope is uh, facing the south, it's probably pretty hot and dry. Um, if your slope is facing the west, getting the afternoon sun, it is also probably hot and dry. But if it's on the other two sides, it's probably shady and maybe damp. And so that slope will help you understand what's going on on your property. And finally, what is the size and shape of the garden that you're interested in? I'm going to suggest you go small and you can always grow from there. I would rather that you do something small and enjoy it than try to take on something that's too big and feels like it's more work than it's worth. So do something small, work your way up as you grow, learn more plants, develop a bigger diversity of plants over time. Okay, so now that we know what's going on with sun, what is your plants that you need? So this marsh blazing star on the right uh, and all of the blazing stars need a full sun uh, system, meaning they need to be in full sun, uh, getting uh, sun for six to 10 hours. However, these blue lobelia and culver's root, two beautiful uh, plants, they only need two to four hours of sun or more. It can, it can handle full sun, but it actually is good in part shade and will bloom with just two hours of sun. Plant size. When is a plant too big? If you're planting this Joe Pie weed on the left that can get eight feet tall in front of your picture window, it's probably not the right plant to choose. However, if you get this Joe pie weed that gets eight feet tall and put it in a screen from the neighbor's tub, uh, uh, you know, the neighbors who have a hot tub and uh, clothing is optional, it might be a really good idea. So pick the plants for the right spots. Tall is good um, as long as you're doing it in the right place um, and, uh, and not over uh, and overdoing your garden. Marsh milkweed gets four or five feet tall. It has a similar bloom. It might be a more appropriate plant for the right size. Trees and shrubs. I love trees and shrubs. I use them all the time for all my gardens. Um, and I uh, and so that glossy black chokeberry that that aronia melanocarpa I told you earlier about for food uh, for the berries. That beautiful blackberry is amazing uh, food uh, uh, jam or jelly. Uh, it uh, aronia uh, black chokeberry stays um, pretty hedge-like. Um, it doesn't really spread very far. It has amazing fall color. It's one of my favorite shrubs that I use. Nine bark can be, uh, uh, if you get a cultivated variety, it might stay short, but some of the, the native one can get very tall, 12, 15 feet tall. Some plants are too aggressive. 
uh, not invasive, just meaning that they want to spread a little too far. So uh, cut plant and obedient plant are, are ones that are, are aggressive, meaning they uh, every seed that lands on the ground tends to make another plant. So look at how aggressive some of the plants are and putting it in the wild area is great. Putting it into your uh, very manicured cultivated garden in the front yard, maybe not. So look at that. And please don't forget the grasses and sedges. There are a million of them. Uh, they're, uh, they really can hold your gardens upright. Uh, they have their own form and function. They're very beautiful on their own. They're ornamental in their own way. Personally, I love sedges with these really cool seed heads. Uh, so the bristly sedge here. My favorite one here is Carex gray eye mace sedge. It's a bright green um, uh, ball about, uh, I don't know, a little bigger than a quarter and, uh, and really um, is a stunning, uh, stunning seed head. Some of my native flowers that I use a lot, that I like, butterfly milkweed on the bottom right, uh, the asters on the upper left, and I think you know black eyed Susans and purple cone flowers. So when I'm thinking about planting, and especially for wildlife, I really need to start creating in layers. Tall, short, shrubs, grasses, flowers, ferns, by doing a whole matrix of plants, a whole variety of plants in, in layers of vertical height, you are actually creating places for them to nest, uh, for our critters to nest or hide or, or, or have a, their own little habitat. And so when I'm looking to do this, I'm looking to determine the wildlife you want to attract. If you're really looking for birds, you need to have a lot of insects and maybe some of that fall berries. Identify the food, water, and shelter that this, these critters are looking for. If you're looking to bring in hummingbirds, what are those amazing hummingbird uh, attractant plants like cardinal flower? Uh, and, and do they have berries? And at what season? And so I like to make sure that there's berries that are late in the fall that persist through the winter like this is uh, bearberry. Bearberry is a short evergreen. Um, it's only a couple inches tall. Uh, it makes a great ground cover. Needs a little more sun. Uh, so part, uh, part shade can be okay. Part sun to full sun is great. That bird produces these amazing red berries that the birds eat late in the winter when they need them. Um, and it's an evergreen. Uh, it's found everywhere out east uh, on the dunes, as well as a few places in the woods uh, or along the edges of woods here in, in uh, Nassau County. And provide water, whether it's a bird bath um, or uh, a, a spot where you have a shallow pool where water sits for a day. You don't want things to sit for uh, more than a few days. Uh, that can potentially breed mosquitoes. And so mix, uh, dump, if you do have a bird bath, dump the bird bath every couple days and fill it back up. But water is really important for, a whole, for, uh, for all of your insects, not just the birds. Um, I like to put stones in my bird bath so that there's a lot of very shallow water so that the bees can come and drink as well. And pollinators are a whole variety of things. The bees, the butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, even birds and bats. And if you're really looking to do pollinators, I would look at this uh, guide. It's uh, from Xerces, X-E-R-C-I-S, X-E-R-C-I-S, Xerces. And they have um, that this, they have selected plants for pollinators for different uh, habitat types. The Eastern Broadleaf Forest is probably your best one for here in Long Island. So layout, design. Um, I really like to plant plants in, uh, in, in groupings. Um, and groupings by color and texture. Um, you think about shape and, so and seasonal blooms the size of the plant and the, and, and the structure of the plant. Is it tall? Is it mounding? Is it uh, um, have uh, big leaves or narrow leaves, wide leaves, um, little leaves? 
um, flower color at different times of the year. But I like to plant in big groups and it can be just a few plants in big organization or a repeating pattern. So if you liked the high line, this is actually the design by Pate Odoff on the high line uh, for one of his sections. And you can see that there's not a lot of plants, but and most of them are native, um, but you can see that there's a repeating pattern. And by doing that repeating pattern, you get some stunning looks. So this is some of his work that he's done in other places. This is my favorite. It kind of looks like a, um, I don't know, a Monet uh, of, of, of subtle colors. He chose a color palette in this case. But this is out on the high line. This is the plants that you can find on the high line, all natives or 90% native. There, you remember that plant I told you has 15 foot deep roots? That's that upper left one right there, the silvery leaf with the purple flowers, that's lead plant. If they can do this in New York City, can't you do this in your backyard? However, if you're going to do it in your backyard and you decide to go a little bit more wild, please think about cues of care. So the picture on the bottom left is um, got a path or a couple pots. The one on the right has a bench. But you can think of, uh, oh, and, and so really we're going to talk about cues of care for a little bit here. But before I go there, I need to talk a little bit about spacing plants and how many plants. So um, if you want to plant things a little bit more uh, cottage garden looking or meadow garden, the one on the left is probably more appropriate for you. The plants are planted eight, 12 to 18 inches apart. Um, if you think about 12 to 18 inches apart, the plants, once they get full size, they touch. They're, you won't see the mulch in between. You, that means that you don't need the mulch ever again. Um, the plants are, uh, when they planted that tight, they support each other, they hold each other up. You don't have to start tying plants up and they really pull, uh, uh, kind of combine and make one look. You can still plant them with patches of plants or you can do it randomly. But when you do that, that uh, tight knit, you're gonna have less maintenance in the long run. So if you're gonna plant 12 to 18, 18 inches apart, um, what you're going to do is you take the square footage of your garden, let's say it's 100 square feet, and you multiply, uh, if you have 100 square feet, you need 100 plants at 12 inches apart. If you multiply that square foot by 0.45, meaning uh, then you're planting your plants 18 inches apart, you, you would need 45 plants. So... 45 to 100 plants in a 100 square foot garden. And 100 square feet is big. That's 10 by 10. If you want your gardens to have a little mulch in between, like the one on the right, it has a different look. It, the plants, you will always see mulch between. Your garden will look a little more manicured, but it also means it means more maintenance. There's more opportunities for weeds to come in, and you're going to need to add mulch to your gardens every, every year. If you like doing that, great. Um, it has a different look, and please just be con conscious of that. So now you're going to probably plant your plants a little further apart. Now, last piece is that's for perennials. For shrubs, what I do is I look for what the mature width of that plant is, and then I figure out how much volume that plant takes. So pi r squared, it's a little bit of math, pi um, 3.14 times the radius of the plant. Let's say it's a uh, five foot diameter plant. So it, uh, two and a half feet, two and a half feet times two and a half feet times pi, you get like 20 square feet. So you're going to take your garden and divide it by 20 to get to see how many shrubs you need within that garden. Borders and edging really can make your garden look very deliberate. 
whether it's a retaining wall or a fence or an arbor or uh, some uh, structure, any of these things will bring that wild garden to make it look more natural and native. You actually saw this garden when it was in full display earlier. It was that shade garden. But look at what I did is I put a little walkway across it and a little um, bird bath. Uh, it's my attempt at being zen. Or put a little split rail fence. You don't have to go all the way around, just an edge. And it looks a little more manicured and it looks a little more rustic. The fence doesn't have to be uh, super elegant, could do a rope fence or an edger. Do you see that it has a red brick edger? This one, a wild and woolly uh, ring uh, garden, but putting that split rail fence in really ties the garden together. And uh, we also look at gardens that um, have plants underneath as well as above. So uh, as much as I love our pine trees, our pitch pine and white pine pine trees, what happens is the, the branches start to die off on the bottom. And so I fill up the space with laurels and uh, skip laurels, mountain laurels, things like that to fill in that gap so that you get a structured garden like the one on the left on the bottom. And turf does not always have to be full turf. There is a no-mow turf uh, grass, which is uh, short grasses. You don't have to mow it as often. But I want to add that you can start thinking of other things like shrubs in masses instead of a, a turf. Um, one of my favorite plants is, is prairie drop seed. It is a beautiful uh, native grass instead of turf. And planting with in, intent, even though it is um, uh, used as a more un, uh, wild garden. Oh, we already saw that one. So the last thing that I have here, uh, I have just a couple slides left, is that on the website, uh, northhempstead. Or sorry, <laughs> northhempsteadny.gov backslash np uh, for native plant. Um, we have uh, a, uh, a series of garden designs. I pulled it right off the website for you um, so you can see them. Um, you can download them. These are, uh, gives you an outlook for a, I think, an attractive garden. On the right is the bloom period. So in April, everything's greening up. In May, we have a little blue. June, we have a little more color. July, you have a little more color. You kind of see how the color changes. This is for a only native plants in a meadow kind of garden, a uh, per perennials garden. And you can, and so then we've labeled where each of these gardens go. So for instance, this is Marta, uh, uh, bee balm is for number six. But you could also, and you can see that for a hundred square foot garden, how many plants you need. And you can go down here for number six, you, uh, and and it says eight plants, Monarda fistulosa, fistulosa wild bee balm. But we have, uh, and so you can kind of see how many plants go into each of these areas. Now, if you don't like one of these plants, let's say you don't really like this number one sneeze weed, it's an unfortunate name for a really great plant. You can look to see what are other plants that would work well in that spot. And so maybe you still want yellow but not uh, sneeze weed, a one that's a little different would be maybe oxeye daisies or black-eyed Susans. So you can mix and match as you wish. Here's one for native part shade to shade garden. Um, and uh, so it's again, uh, all, all perennials, but part shade to shade. One for shrubs in shade, and one for shrubs in sun. So I'm going to stop there. 
does anybody have any questions? I see the chat box is full. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rusty. Um, so we're a little after eight o'clock. So if you do have to go, um, we, like I said, well, we have recorded this. So we're going to put it on the website. And I also will uh, be able to email it to everyone that registered for this. So you can always watch the answers to the questions later. Um, we have a few. Um, this one is more of a comment, but um, someone says that deer will eat your red twig dogwood. So you need to protect them if you have deer pressure. Yes, uh, they can. Um... There's a couple tricks to that. Um, uh, I have used uh, a deer scarecrow for a small garden, which is, you can look them up online. Uh, it's a hawk head, uh, like, a, like a bird of prey hawk. Uh, and uh, it's not, uh, it's, it, that's what it looks like. It's actually, the mouth is a clapping sprinkler. The eyes are a motion detector. You put it up in, the, in uh, late spring, um, and you pretty much spray, sp uh, spray the deer with water. They don't like it. They run off. You train the deer to leave that alone. And then about June time, you can take the batteries out and roll up the hose and leave the hawk there to as a as the scarecrow part. So there are some tricks, um, but uh, the the better way is to uh, surround it with uh, with um, fence during the winter time, and then take it down in the spring. They, they don't tend to eat woody's, woody plants in, in the summer. Thank you. Um, what is the maintenance required for something like the front yard in Nassau County picture and what is the water requirement? So uh, water, uh, um, Megan can probably answer that very specifically um, on her, on that yard, but I would suspect that the water was um, once, a week or once every two weeks uh, as it got established. And then since it's been established, probably never turned the water on again. Um, and maintenance um, is probably out there once a month or so to weed that first year. And then after that, um, go out there and weed once every other year, this, or every other month, the second month, or second year, sorry. And the third month, you just look for the occasional weed and you're out there maybe once every, you know, once or twice the whole uh, year. Yes, um, as Rusty said, I can answer it personally because that is my front yard. <laughs> um, like you said, I don't, I don't weed very much. Even if there are a few weeds, I don't really notice them. Um, the most weeds I have is I have like a, a path that you can't really see because the plants are blocking it. So there's not, there's no plant surrounding the path, which I'm trying to fix and put some ground cover in. Um, so that's mostly where I get weeds. Other than that, um, not, not really anything or nothing that I notice. And then I really haven't had to water the past few years. Last year, I did water a little bit just because I had put in some plants last year. And it, with the drought, I, I was afraid they were going to die. So I kept watering them throughout the, the really dry part of the summer. Okay, next question. Does poison ivy or sumac have a tendency to grow in a native garden? Um, poison ivy, if you have it... Uh near your property, it can come in. Um, it doesn't tend to jump. It usually doesn't come into your native gardens. It usually stays in the woods. Um, however, I don't want to say you're not going to get it and then you call me up or egg my house later. So um, I don't want to promise it, but it's very seldom, unless you already have it on the property, it tends not to come in. Um, and then sumac, native, uh, all of Almost all of our sumacs are not poisonous. They're, they're great. They're great for wildlife. They're great for deer, um, all that. But there is one poison sumac. Um, I've only seen it a couple times on Long Island. Um, and again, in the woods, not in people's yards. Okay. Um, what roses do you recommend? So there are a couple native roses that most people don't know about. Um, the Missouri rose, the Virginia rose, and the, uh, what's the other one? Prairie rose, and there's one more, meadow rose. Those are all native to not only Long Island, um, but almost all of the U.S. And they're shrub roses. They're not, they don't, the roses don't look like you get in the florist shop. They're usually broad with just 
uh, uh, six eight pedals with a yellow center. Um, they're 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 not opening up. Uh, they just kind of just are, and they're apps. I think they're stunning. They're they're a beautiful plant, and they do very very well. Um, please don't get Rosa rugosa or the beach rose. Um, everyone thinks it's native. It's not. It's from uh, Asia, and it's really taking over. So please don't get that one. Um, uh, it has a similar flower. People think it's the same. Um, and it says beach rose. So everyone thinks it's native, but it's not. Um, so, um, and then honestly, those, if you surround, if you have knockout roses or, you know, uh, uh, proper cut roses, you have your beautiful, you know, non-native roses, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with any of them. Just put some other native plants around it. You don't have to have 100% native yard. You just might want to be closer to 70, 80, 90% instead of 5 or 10% that most yards are currently. Great. Um, if you moved into a house that has a sprinkler system, how should you use it for a native flower garden? Um, I don't. Um, I <laughs> so I moved into a house three years ago with an irrigation sprinkler system. And not only did I never turn it on, but I, uh, ax I, 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 I didn't do it on purpose, but it's been ripped out of the backyard for, for construction reasons, and I'm not going to replace it. Um, my backyard's all native plants. Um, I don't need it. Um, I have a, a garden hose that goes to my vegetable garden, and that's it. Otherwise, I don't turn on my sprinkler system. Um, so, um, so once the if you have one, if you're going to put in a native garden, you can have your uh, set your zone up for that native garden to uh, water when you are starting your your native garden. But once the plants are established or mature, you can turn off that zone and never use it again. Okay. Um, what herbs are native? I'm, I'm thinking maybe they mean edible herbs. Yeah, so um, Agastache hyssop, um, uh, the Agastache funicula, which is uh, licorice hyssop, has um, a, 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 lic uh, a licorice uh, uh, taste to it. All the mints, the bee balms and the mints, they're all uh, used for uh, flavoring for mints. Um, uh, there's a, a mountain mint and uh, is a huge variety. Um, uh, there, um, there's a rush. There, there's a uh, a prairie sage. Uh, that sage is also used more uh, more traditionally for um, sage smoke than for ed uh, edibles, but uh, it it can be used both. That sassafras that I told you about earlier makes a great uh, tea or or drink. So there's a there's a lot more than you think, um, and uh, and. But the ones that most people are thinking about, the thymes, the rosemaries, the, you know, the uh, basils, uh, none of those are native. It doesn't mean you can't have them, just, just not native. Okay, what app do you recommend for identifying trees and shrubs already in place? Uh, <laughs> um, so... Personally, I like using iNaturalist. Um, it gets me close. Um, and uh, for trees and shrubs, you really need a picture of the leaf and the flower. Try to get a few different pictures of different times of the year, and then it's going to help you identify. Um, uh, the trees and shrubs are less complicated than the flowers uh, and grasses, so it tends to be pretty good. I've heard that Plant Snap and Plant App are good, but I don't use them um, mainly because I don't need it, need to. So I'm I'm not probably the right person to ask on this. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, the, but it's it, that one is a good start. Great, that's the one I use as well. So another vote for iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. um, so someone was thinking about adding a wild garden in the backyard. Do they need a barrier at the bottom of the fences that border with neighbors? Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, 
No, because you should be sharing your plants to the neighbors. <laughs> um, 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 how I do a barrier is not a barrier like a root barrier, like for bamboo. I change the barrier up by planting plants that aren't going to spread uh, in the back row. So along the fence line, I might put in my shrubs that really act as, a, as its own barrier. So now if I put in that red twig dogwood or the elderberry or the uh, Ronia melanocarpa or things like that, the, the black chokeberry, the things in the back row, not only are they taller, but they're really not going to be spreading underneath the fence. And so you're going to keep them on your side. And then the things that do spread a little bit um, aren't going to uh, uh, really climb underneath it because they're going to get shaded out. So that's my type of root barrier when I'm thinking about, or uh, uh, plant barrier when I'm thinking about it. Um, most of the time, I don't really worry about it. Most of the plants don't spread like that crazy. Um, most of the plants that do spread crazy are usually not native and are, and a lot of them are on the invasive species list. So we really, it, you know, um, there's a reason why our good plants are getting pushed around a bit is that they aren't that aggressive. So um, it's usually not a concern. That same person said that the neighbors gave them bamboo. So maybe you should try to spread some of your native plants. In yeah, your so, so <laughs> the, neighbor, the neighbor's giving you bamboo, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> I would put in that root barrier at your property line to keep the bamboo out and then plant your native plants on your side. Okay, we have one more question. Can these plants survive in wet areas that get standing water and moisture for a few days after heavy rainfall? Absolutely. Half the plants that I showed you today will do great with that. So anything that has the word marsh in it, marsh milkweed um, or swamp or any of those, um, love that extra water. So instead of butterfly milkweed, I would use marsh milkweed. Um, I would think about bone set, um, which is uh, uh, Part of the Joe Pie family, Eucatorium perfoliatum, uh, it has white flowers instead of magenta flowers. That sneeze weed would love that extra moisture. Um, uh, the liatris, uh, the marsh blazing star would be perfect for that spot. So a lot of uh, the plants that I showed you, cardinal flower, blue lobelia, um, culver's root, um, turtle head, all of those plants would love all that extra moisture. And the more the merrier. Oh, a couple of our uh, the our native iris, a uh, blue flag iris, um, loves all that extra moisture. And our native hibiscus, there is a native hibiscus um, need, that would love that water as well. It's uh, it's um, rose mallow. And the, I'm trying to keep remembering the common names. And lastly. The only place to plant a hydrangea, and there is one native hydrangea, a hydrangea arborescens, um, which is uh, a relative of the snowball hydrangea, the old fashioned one, that, uh, that is uh, the only place to put in a hydrangea is in water. Hydro is the name of hydrangea for a reason. You do not need to water them if they're in water. So they will grow uh, very, very well there. Great, that was the last question. So I just wanna thank everyone for being with us tonight. Big thanks to Rusty for this wonderful and extremely informative presentation. Um, I hope everyone was able to learn a lot about these great native plants and hopefully will be inspired to put them in your own landscapes. Um, I also wanna remind everyone that Rusty will also be teaching a workshop on rain gardens for the town. Um, that one is on March 29th at 6.30 p.m. You can register where you register for this workshop if you're interested. So, so I, um, I, one I, last I, quick question. Can you spell the name of that native hydrangea? I saw that too, so good. So, <laughs> It, uh, you, you spelled hydrangea, right? So that's the first part. Arboren Arboensis, A-R-B-O-E-N-S-C-E-N-S, -E I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put a, a link in the chat. It's to the town's native plant webpage. And I have 
a, a list of native plants on there. So if you're interested, you can sort through it by the conditions in your site that you're putting your garden in. So you could say, I have dry soil, I have a sunny site, what are the plants that are good for me? Um, so if, if you would like to start planning your garden and maybe hopefully apply for that rebate program we have, again, we don't know if we have the funding yet, but <laughs> can start, always start planning. Um, there's some good resources on that site as well. Thank you once again and good night, everyone. Thank you.